Good morning. Would you accept, Mrs Thatcher, that you, as much as anything, more than anything perhaps, have become the issue in this campaign? No, I don't think so. I don't think that's right. My first interview with a Prime Minister on today, Margaret Thatcher. A truly scary prospect for the new boy. If only because you could never be quite sure what she might say. How can you express unselfish love if you have no choice? I understand. I'm, I, I, I'm not going to get into the, the, the fundamentals of Christianity. The fundamental choice is the right to choose between good and evil. Imagine getting into a discussion with a modern party leader a few days before a general election and talking theology. Is that not right? The, Bishop the of fundamental Stan reason of being on this earth is so to improve your character that you are fit for the next world. Mrs. Thatcher was, in so far as any politician has ever been, unspun. Of course, she had a press secretary. What she didn't have was a vast team of spin doctors who monitor, even sometimes dictate, ministers' every move and every word. On the telephone now, from 10 Downing Street, Mrs. Thatcher, who I gather has just heard the news, Prime Minister. Hello, good morning. I heard it on your news briefing. Uh, it was the first indication we've had, but of course we understand. When there's a tragedy like that, Mr Gorbachev has to... Years out. later, her press secretary, Bernard Ingham, told me the first he knew of his boss being interviewed was when he heard it as he was driving to work. He nearly drove off the road, he said. Unimaginable today. Mrs Thatcher never complained about the treatment she got at the hands of us lot. Things started changing when John Major came to power, and I had a, a sort of friendly chat with the Chancellor, Ken Clark. And at least you have to admit, I've got a debate going. Well, you certainly have. I hope it's a slightly more sensible you. debate than we've I, had <laughs> the last month or two. Well, something. I don't know who you're addressing those comments to, perhaps to your own Chief Secretary, Jonathan Aitken, because he ruled it out. I mean, he said last week, I don't want to see a single currency, period. And this he week. went on to say, but you never say never in well, politics. He, uh, well, and, he also went on to say, I would, hesi I would hesitate for an eternity. <laughs> Well, maybe not too friendly. A few weeks later, the Cabinet Minister, Jonathan Aitken, made a speech attacking me for having poisoned the well of democratic debate. He claimed I'd interrupted Mr Clark 32 times in that one interview, and ministers should stop exposing themselves to that sort of treatment. Not that it bothered Mr Clark. There were two occasions where colleagues took it upon themselves to complain that I'd been interrupted on the radio, and it was not at my request, and I couldn't understand what on earth they were going on about. Uh, my reaction when interrupted by Humphreys was to interrupt his questions if he was going to interrupt my answers. Labour have swept to power in the election. They're heading for their biggest ever majority of 179 seats. Everything changed when new Labour arrived on the scene, led by a fresh-faced young Tony Blair. John Major is expected to go to Buckingham Palace at 11.30 this morning, formally to hand in his resignation as Prime Minister. He'll be followed to the palace by Mr Blair, who'll be asked by the Queen to form a government. New Labour, new approach to the media. And it worked at the start. When Mr Blair started getting into big trouble over sleaze allegations, he invited me down to Chequers to talk to him for On the Record. People know me well enough and realise the type of person I am to realise that, that I would never do anything either to harm the country or, or anything proper. I never have. I think most people who have dealt with me think I'm a pretty straight sort of guy, and I am. A month later, trouble on a different front. There are many women with children under the age of five who want to work and through lack of I'm affordable high-quality I'm talking about those who do not want to work, and I'm asking you the question, are you saying to them, ultimately it is our aim to get people like you into work? Is that what you're saying? No, it's a very what, straightforward question. No, well, I'm giving you a very straightforward answer, John, which is that we are, for the first time, offering those lone mothers no, with children under five... No, you're not answering the question. With the greatest of respect, you're answering choice. your question. No. I'm asking you to answer my question. Do you want those women? You talk about ending the dependency culture. Are you saying to women with young children who are living by themselves, we would like you to work? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that I want for those women what they want for themselves, and that means choice. Right, and and what this they government, want, many of them, is for you not to, to, to impose those cuts that you're imposing today. They have had no choice in the past because they've been given no help to work, and that's the direction in which we're going. Harriet Harman, thank you very much. That exchange, admittedly a rather lively one with Harriet Harman, who was the Social Security Secretary at the time, produced a response from Downing Street the like of which this programme had never generated before. A letter threatening to withdraw cooperation from today unless something was done about what they called the John Humphreys problem. 
That letter foreshadowed a more confrontational relationship between Downing Street and journalists, especially in the BBC, over the years to come. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. In 2003, we invaded Iraq because, we were told by Tony Blair, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. He didn't. Three months later... It is now seven minutes past six. The government's facing more questions this morning over its claims about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Our defence correspondent is Andrew Gilligan. This in particular, Andy, is Tony Blair saying they'd be ready to go within 45 minutes? That's right. That was a central claim in his dossier, which he published in September, the main... Um, case, if you like, against, uh, against Iraq and, uh, and the main statement of the British government. A perfectly unremarkable early morning three-minute interview with a correspondent. I've done thousands of them over the last 30 years. Did I say unremarkable? It was to almost bring down the BBC. Andrew Gilligan had been told by a reliable source that the dossier warning us of the threat from Saddam had been deliberately sexed up. The government denied it, but ultimately... It was to lead to the suicide of Gilligan's source, Dr David Kelly, the destruction of Tony Blair's reputation, and the resignation of the two most senior men in the BBC, Chairman and Director General. Orchestrating the government's defence was the number 10 spin doctor, Alistair Campbell, easily the most powerful man ever to hold that role. Some years later, I spoke to Campbell about the effect he'd had on the relationship between politicians and the media during the early years of Blair's leadership. And I was always of the view, when Tony asked me to work for him, that we had to change the terms of the trade, that the press had been, frankly, setting the political agenda, particularly when John Major was in power, less so with Mrs Thatcher, but certainly with Major there, and in a way that, to, in my mind, was detrimental to the interests of the Labour Party. So we did make changes, and some of those changes... Uh, I think were absolutely ne necessary, and I would, uh, <clears throat> I would I would defend them to the hilt. I think at times we probably went over the top. I think that sometimes we were too aggressive, and I think that sometimes uh, <clears throat> we, when we got into government for the first couple of years, we maybe took some of the techniques of opposition into government. But I think it's still important that people understand that in the end, when people talk about what the Blair years have been about, it has been about the steady transformation of Britain. <laughs> This approach is stuck in the past, and I want to talk about the future. He was the future once. <laughs> David Cameron may have been the heir to Blair, but he did not inherit the Blair spin machine, or rather he believed that if he appealed directly to the people, they would listen to what he had to say and respect his wisdom. In the end, that was to bring him down. We have had in this country treaty after treaty passing powers from Britain to Brussels, and it is time for the British people to have a decisive say in an in-out referendum. That was May 2015. Thirteen months later, the British people did decide. I love this country, and I feel honoured to have served it. And I will do everything I can in future to help this great country succeed. Thank you very much. And the Prime Minister is not going to take any questions. He is now walking back into Downing Street with his wife, Samantha. And if you have just joined us, what he said in part was, the country requires fresh leadership. It would not be right for me to be the captain to steer us to the next destination. A new Prime Minister must be in place by October. So now, another new dawn, another Prime Minister, another approach to getting the message across. It would not be right for me or this government to give a running commentary on negotiations. Nor has there been. On the contrary, this is a Prime Minister who's been attacked for keeping her true thoughts to herself, so far at least. That may change over the coming days when we find out what she really means when she tells us Brexit means Brexit. But still... Hard to imagine her doing a Thatcher and discussing theology at ten past eight on the Today programme.